I want to bring in Tasha Kina joining us from ARK Invest. She's an analyst. Tasha, great to have you back on the program. Good to see you. Thank you. So firstly, I want to just point out your recent tweet about Tesla and the ride hailing. We're going to hit some different companies today, but walk me through this case because I think it's pretty interesting. Is this a real possibility for them? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this. So this is this is my latest research. Um, so, so basically in the past, uh, Tesla said that they could launch a ride hailing network ahead of reaching full autonomy. So this would have human drivers and basically they learn the ins and outs of ride hailing. What's so interesting about that is that um, we actually think that a ride hailing network with human drivers could be a very profitable business for Tesla, basically because they have a lower cost structure than Uber and Lyft thanks to their vertical integration. And it's actually just cheaper to drive a Tesla on an operating cost basis um, because it's a, you know, a, a performance electric vehicle. Um, so, so we think this could be a massive opportunity for Tesla and it's really being overlooked. Um, if you think about, you know, we have our, our bull and our bear thesis for Tesla. Our bear thesis assumes that they don't reach full autonomy um, because it's still sort of an unproven area. But um, this ride hailing network basically provides sort of, um, you know, a downside protection risk on that case. So they still transform their business into a software as a service like model. Um, and, and we think it, it could be a great opportunity. And, and Tesla should actually launch now. Um, because uh, the, the gig economy, you know, people are wanting to get back to work um, and, and consumers are avoiding public transportation. I, I think it could be a great opportunity. It almost sounds like there's like a pseudo kind of philanthropic element to this in a way, not really the precise word, but given the circumstances of what's happening right now, would it be profitable to Tesla or is this going to be a distraction from their, their core message, which is still trying to stay profitable and, you know, get the business going. Oh, we think it could be very profitable to t for Tesla. I mean, if you look at Uber's uh, market in core cities, you know, they're getting a 45 percent EBITDA margin. We think Tesla could actually get higher um, because, again, they have a better cost structure than Uber and Lyft. They're vertically integrated on the finance and insurance side. Um, and on top of that, it's a better equation for the drivers if this car is actually cheaper to drive per mile, because then you can imagine the drivers get more take home pay or Tesla could take a higher take rate off of those gross revenues. Um, so, you know, Tesla could and, and they'd also get more miles for autonomy um, if, if they do successfully launch a ride hailing network. So it actually furthers that goal as well. Um, so, so I think, you know, this is there's a clear business case for this. Mm. And it doesn't have to be fully autonomous, even though Elon's been talking about that again lately. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so today Elon said that he's, you know, he's very confident that they will get a, a the basic functionality of level five autonomy this year. And, you know, Tesla is really um, ahead of the pack on this front because they have this massive data advantage. They're taking data from customer cars. Um, so again, this, this would actually further that goal because then these cars would be very highly utilized vehicles compared to personal cars. You know, they use less than 5% of the time. Um, or, yeah, taxi gets over a 30% utilization rate on average. Um, so, so this could just get them more miles, basically more data to feed that engine and to prove mm. to regulators, hey, this is safe. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Let's talk about a few companies here, because in the list of companies behind your guys' funds, most of them are either at or near highs. Arc Q for the year is up 32 percent. Arc K, two of your ETFs, that one's up 61 percent. So today I want to go into some of the ones that are lagging here. And the really interesting companies, Natasha, I want to start with Stratasys, which is basically part of the 3D printing story. What's going on here? I would think that this would be in a lot of demand right now if there's supply chain problems and hangups for getting parts? Yes. Um, so, so Stratasys is certainly one of the most undervalued 3D printing companies. It's trading like a value stock. It has a price to book ratio below one. And what we th clearly think is a growth industry. We think 3D printing is around 10 to $15 billion today in, in its, its market. And it could go to a, a roughly $90 billion in the next five years. Um, so there's, there's two sides to this story right now. So 3D printing, um, it comes in, it's, it's very key in, in a time like, uh, you know, the current pandemic, because it basically allows you to, certainly in plastics, create parts cheaply and very quickly. So if you need a part fast and you, you don't want to wait for the injection molded tool to print it, you're going to look to something like 3D printing. So we've seen all those 
um, face shields that have been 3D printed. They're 3D printing nasal swabs, um, they're, but, but they're also 3D printing um, pieces of actual medical equipment that's going into hospitals because they need those parts fast. Um, the, the other side of this is, well, what's happening with the other traditional industries that are not the medical space that are using 3D printing? Um, and, you know, of course, this is to buy a 3D printer, that, that's a capital decision. Um, so you would see sort of in the shorter term some delay in those capital purchases. Um, but in the longer term, certainly coming out of this pandemic, we think companies, there'll be supply shortages. I mean, we've already sort of seen that as, as um, you know, certainly sort of the auto industry and these more industrial industries have started to ramp back up after the shutdown period. There's going to be supply gaps. And again, if you need parts fast, you're going to look to something like 3D printing. In fact, um, Airbus, that's how they first got to using um, Stratasys technology uh, for some of their parts. They, they were in a pinch and they needed the parts fast. They still use the technology today because it has so many advantages. It saves on cost, it saves on weight, and that can be huge for an aerospace player, especially on the margin side. Um, so, so I think longer term, sort of that's the story with 3D printing, that it helps, helps you bring manufacturing closer to home and it helps you solve those supply gaps. So, so I think um, you know, there, there'll be this, this other sort of burst that we'll see coming out of that industry. So why is the company been so flat in its revenue for the last five to six years? I'm looking at the yearly revenue between 600 and 700 million. It's actually declined the last couple of years coming into this. Are they not getting big industrial customers to, to renew contracts? Are they not figuring out the, the perfect products to, uh, for, to, to be printed on a regular basis? Uh, what's going on there? Yeah, so um, to talk a little bit about the history with 3D printing. So, um, you know, in the 2014, 2015 period, there's this consumer hype phase, the idea that there'd be a printer in everyone's house. That never materialized, and, and we don't think it ever will. In fact, um, the best use cases for 3D printing are in industries like healthcare and aerospace. Um, and those industries also happen to be highly regulated, and it, and it takes time for these companies to, to work 3D printing into their specifications mm. and to get those parts approved. Um, so I think investors coming out of that consumer hype phase were sort of expecting a faster acceleration of those exciting end use part applications, parts that go into the final product versus a prototype. Um, but it, it takes time. Um, so, so I think um, we, we are, you know, in terms of that top line revenue growth, um, they've had this period now where they've been able to work with companies like Airbus, like Boeing, and, and work work their way into those specification requirements and those approvals. Um, and certainly, you know, for, for in the medical space, um, we've had insur the um, insurance codes for 3D printed parts are, are a new thing. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't previously get coverage on some of these 3D printed implants. Um, so, so we've really been laying those backbones over the past few years. Um, so, so again, I, I think going forward, that's where you'll sort of see, um, you know, those those that work pay off. So, is the printer a high margin investment eventually, or is it still expensive from a per unit basis? Yeah. So, um, it, for a per unit basis, well, well, I guess what three D printing is really best at is parts that are low volume and very complex. So that's why it's great for aerospace. For instance, it's great for building rockets because um, you're not there aren't that many pieces. You're not building you know millions of rockets. You're only building a small set number. Um, and 3D printing can get you these architectures that you couldn't get with traditional manufacturing. Mm. So you can combine parts. You can make the parts stronger, and you can often switch materials as well, which reduces weight. Um, so, so you really, it's, it, you have to look at it on this holistic view. You know, I'm, I'm iterating faster in my design phase, so that saves me time. Um, I'm, I'm able to uh, quickly prototype and then, and then change my design if I want to. And then, and then on the, on the other end of things, I'm able to save on the weight equation. Um, so, so you really sort of have to look at that, that full picture view to see the benefit of 3D printing. Um, but you know, we're seeing great early signs of that. There are over a hundred thousand Stratasys parts flying right now on airplanes today. Mm. Um, so, so we know that this is a proven technology and it's, it's in the market, it works. All right, so it's not necessarily about churning out a bunch of stuff at a high rate and high margin. It almost sounds like there's still kind of an, an almost an academic uh, uh, theme to it in a way where it allows people to experiment, try different things. What about Proto Labs, another stock in your guys' fund? This is it looks like it's connected, uh, if not directly to 3D, but overall within parts making, and it's done fairly well this year. Back to a uh, 52-week high post-COVID, it's dropped off a little bit. What's going on here? 
Yeah, so um, Proto Labs is a rapid part manufacturer. So they're really good at low volume um, part batch runs. And, and basically they're, they have a highly automated process it makes it really easy to get a quote on a part, and then um, you know you you know when you're getting it, and, it, and you'll get it fast. Um, so they use 3D printing, but they also use traditional technologies like injection molding. Um, so actually, they've had uh, a, a a lot of orders come in during um, the pandemic. So they've had over. 4 million parts produced or on order related to COVID-19. Um, you know, this is diagnostic equipment. This, these are medical supplies. Um, and that's, uh, it's actually, it's using some of their traditional manufacturing like in, injection molding um, to do that. But, but they're, they're able to get those parts again because they're so highly automated and they have this, um, this software, very turnkey approach to manufacturing. Um, again, that makes it perfect for a company that's sort of in a pinch and needs the parts fast. Hmm. Right now, uh, this is a company that's making money on the bottom line. Uh, it generates earnings over the past year, about $2. So uh, really interesting uh, uh, take here from the innovation side. And where do these fit in on the waiting? Uh, just remind us here for the funds, how does this compare to the autonomous cars and the vehicle plays? Yeah, so um, for our funds, you know, all of that information is online. You can see uh, since we're ETFs, we actually um, we have emails that go out every day that, that show our trades. Um, but Stratasys has always been a, a top position for us. Um, you know, Pro Proto Labs is, is, is up there as well in the portfolio. But again, all that information is um, online. You can see for the fund, um, you know, Tesla, our largest position, you, if you consider that an autonomous vehicle play. Um, so, you know, we, we have very high confidence in both of these industries. And, and we think certainly during a time like now, um, companies are gonna look to innovation in general because that's how you get this better, faster, cheaper. And when you're forced to cut costs in your core business and when you know the sort of the, the rest of industry is slowing down and you need to reconsider things, you're going to look to these new innovations um, really sort of across all of the technologies that ARC looks at. All right, judging from the price action this year, it seems to be the case. And we actually got it right there, about 29.7%, about 30 for the 3D printing composition in the fund. Appreciate you joining us, Tasha. Good stuff as always. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Tasha Keeney is an analyst at ARK Invest.